All right, well, you may be seated. Tonight we are be embarking on uh, John chapter 4, John chapter uh, 4. And we kind of entitle this uh, chapter around the thought of uh, the life-changing encounter. I think uh, John chapter 4 is probably one of the most renowned probably chapters in the book of John, I think, because everybody knows something about Jesus' encounter with the lady at the well, the Samaritan woman. I think we done heard that preached a lot, we done heard it taught a lot, and that's one part that we really do, uh, got a good understanding of. And, but I think there's some things that we can see from this encounter when we go through and slow it down just a little bit that may help us to understand the significance of what uh, Jesus uh, did when he encountered this lady at the well. Because what you're gonna see in here is that this was one of the first times that Jesus had revealed his true identity, his purpose for coming uh, to someone other than his disciples. And even they didn't fully understand who he was, but this was the first time he really made it clear exactly you know, who he was, what he came to do. And so this woman, a Gentile, had the opportunity to be in a key part in spreading the gospel. And we're gonna see that when we uh, get into this tonight. So if you're looking at uh, John chapter 4, those of you that was here last time, you kind of, don't forget everything we talked about last week with Nicodemus. Because you're going to see some of them same mindset that Nicodemus had that's going to play over into this conversation with this lady. So I hope you can get that connected knowledge, you know, when Jesus was talking to her or to Nicodemus as well in spiritual things, he understood what, he, what Jesus had said in a natural way, and his response was natural. And we're gonna see that tonight, that when Jesus says certain things to this lady, her comeback is gonna be very natural. She's not gonna get it, and then he's gonna have to kinda have further discussion to bring it into light and into focus what he was trying to get her to see. And what that means to us is that sometimes when you read God's word, you can't always look at it from your natural point of view and your natural understanding. You're gonna have to try to dig a little deeper and let the word of God get into your spirit and let your spirit receive God's word because the Bible said, you know, God is a spirit and so therefore his, his word is spirit and, and it's true. And so therefore sometimes when we look at his word purely from a natural or a, a, a humanistic worldview and not a spiritual worldview, we can miss the intent of what God is trying to get us to see. That makes sense to anybody? Okay, so let's look at this tonight. He says now, uh, Verse 1, and I want you to see Jesus' popularity. And we know that John the Baptist has been spreading the word about Jesus, saying, you know, there's one coming that's greater than I am. And he was talking about he was making the way for Jesus. And then all of a sudden, Jesus appeared on the scene. And, and, and the word get out, and we're going to see here, that, that Jesus' popularity must have started to pick up. It says, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So this is where we get the concept that, hey, Jesus' notoriety picked up. Everybody talking about him. He the new guy in town. And, and now the old guy, the old team, they, you know, they're a little jealous. Because now they, they, they could handle the fact that John the Baptist was getting on their nerves. You know, because he was just preparing the way for Jesus. But now there's a the guy on the scene who's baptizing more people than even John was. In other words, every party that Jesus brought into his camp would probably take it from their camp. And so therefore, because of this, there was this natural uh, spirit of jealousy that crept, crept up into them. And so Jesus understood that. And because he knew it wasn't his time to confront them at this time, he decided to, okay, let me leave the area. So, so that's what we see here is that and again, let me go back and make one more point. Jesus didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So now, if Jesus' disciples did the baptizing, then that means that, you know, uh, in the church, the pastor don't have to baptize everybody. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you don't have to, everybody don't have to get baptized by the pastor. Someone is, is authorized to do it, and they can perform the baptism, they ought to be allowed to do it. So I hope people don't think that, man, I'm getting baptized and pastor is the only one. No, Jesus didn't baptize nobody. His disciples did. So any man or woman of God 
who has been authorized to do that should be able to perform that ceremony and no one should be feel like they're being slighted because it's not necessarily the pastor. Okay? And, and so, now look at this. In verse 3 it says, uh, so he left Judea and returned to Galilee. And verse 4 says, he had to go through Samaria on the way. Now that's a very important point there. So you can imagine uh, the easiest way to look at this, say for instance, you trying to get from here to uh, Op, Alabama, and you're in Fort Walton Beach. And in order to, the straight shot to get to Op is you gotta go through Crestview. You know, you gotta go through Crestview. And so now, but if you hate the folk that live in Crestview, you don't even wanna, won't even wanna come in contact with them. You just think they're so defiled, they're just so evil. And now you're going to drive all the way around, go through Milton and, and up that, what, Andalusia and all that to circle back when you could have just went straight through Crestview. And so this was the, 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 the mindset is that many of the Jews, because of their prejudices, would not go through Samaria. They didn't want to have no dealings with the Samaritans. And so therefore, Jesus kind of break a norm here because Jesus wasn't about trying to go around a place. You know, he, he wanted to go through the place because his intent was to make more disciples. He wasn't trying to save time. You know, sometimes you take the shortcut and go straight. You're trying to save time. But Jesus was trying to save people lives. And so therefore, we got to understand is that sometime when God send us to some a place or to a person, we got to stop trying to go around some folk. When God may be sending you directly to that person. And sometimes the people that God will send you through or bring across your path may not be someone that looked like you. See, we have a tendency to believe that God only allow us to evangelize the folk that look like us. Our pigmentation. We feel calm. But what if God wants you to minister to someone other than someone of our persuasion? Will you let your prejudice and your hang-ups, what you heard about folk, keep you from being a witness for the Lord? Will you go around that person so you ain't even got to meet him in the hallway because you just, you know, the Lord told you to talk to him with you? So I believe that sometimes if we're not careful, we can have some of the same hidden biases that you know the Jews had, but the Jews not just by it, they was just straight up prejudice against the Samaritans. I mean, they, they, did, they did not like the Samaritans. Now what you're gonna find out here in a few minutes that they were distant relatives. I mean, they traced their roots back to the same person. And you figure they will put their prejudice aside when they look like, hey, we trace our roots back to the same person. Now look at this, I'm, I'm in verse, Verse 4 again, he says, he had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, in verse 6 he says, and Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime, in the heat of the day. Now, those of you who are kind of Bible scholars, that word Jacob ought to mean something to y'all. Because who is Jacob? Say it, somebody loud. I mean, we, I'll repeat you. Repeat it. Jacob was who? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Okay, and so now God changed his name to who? Israel, and how many boys did he have? Twelve. Twelve. So some of these same Samaritans trace their roots back to one of them boys. So that made them cousins. Amen. So what happened was, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, I mean, yes, the Old Testament is that 
when the kingdom got divided, when they first got it was a united kingdom, when they got divided into a northern and southern kingdom, 10 tribes went to the north, and then Judah and Benjamin stayed in the southern region. Those two tribes later became what we would call the Jews because they considered themselves pure. They, they had been diluted. Amen. Because the 10 tribes got overtaken by the Assyrians, and when they got overtaken by the Assyrians, they intermarried. Mixed race kids, you know, just like today, we live in a society where, you know, everybody ain't pure. Hey Amen. Ain't no, ain't no pure bread, nobody hardly today. But there are definitely some kids who are born into a the clearly defined interracial marriage. And so those kids, by nature, are mixed. And so that's what they were seeing here, that these Samaritans were Jews early on because they traced their roots back to Jacob and Israel. But then when they intermarried, they looked at them as half-breeds. You know. See, when coming up as a, as a little boy watching the Western Major, when they had the Cowboys and the Indians on there, the Indians had a problem when some of the Ladies had babies, and both sides did, and they called them half-breeds. They weren't pure. Their pedigree was diluted. You know, and so not to, I'm just using that as an example. And so just imagine, we go that far even with dogs now. You know, some people want to AKA certify something. They don't want no dog that got mixed. Oh, uh, y'all don't hear me. <laughs> they don't want no mud. They don't want nobody with a little mud in them. A little bit of everything. I mean, they don't want no mud. They want a pure bread. Some of y'all pay big money with some serious papers so you make sure you got your pure bread dog. Amen. Amen. And so now, take that and take that mindset now. And, and look at it from the standpoint of how these people saw other people. I told you on Sunday, that's why when Paul was talking about his pedigree, he said, I'm a Hebrews, Hebrew of the tribe of Benjamin. Letting everybody know that, hey, I'm, I'm not mixed blooded. And so what these Jews were, they, they looked down on the Samaritans because they considered them to be less than. That's why when Jesus taught the parable about the good Samaritan, y'all remember that? That was the whole truth to that, is that out of all the people that walked by the man who was hurt, the Jews, the religious people, it was a Samaritan who stopped, which would have been the one who shouldn't have stopped because he know how, hey, I know how y'all feel about us, so why am I going to stop and help you? And so, you know, we have that same spirit here in America. Amen. We just don't call them Samaritans and Jews. It's just black folk and white folk. And now we got Hispanics tied up in this mess. Amen. So my point is that you got people who are sitting in church right now. And some of them are very prejudiced, even though they say they love the Lord. Now I hope that ain't none of y'all here, none of y'all lying. I'm pretty sure y'all delivered now. But just in case you know somebody. I mean, there could be. There could be. I mean, just can't get along with folks if they don't look like you, don't talk like you. That ain't God's best. Major, go ahead. So when we worship, then why do we worship with only people we have commonality with? I mean, we worship a lot of times with. If you if you were to look go somewhere say say you PCS somewhere you're not more times than not I won't say all the time but more times than not you won't go ask somebody that don't look like you where's the church you're gonna go to somebody that looks like you and say hey where's a good church or where's a black church I mean, if 
And, 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 and that's because our, our culture, we have been engineered to operate like that. For a long time, our school system was divided the same way. So it shouldn't be no different. If the schools are divided like that, the church is going to be divided like that. And then when blacks were allowed in the AME, when the AME came about, Richard and Allen, when they were allowed to go to worship, they put them in the balcony. They wouldn't let them even mingle with them on the floor. So eventually they broke away. And so that same spirit is still at a day. Now there are a lot of multicultural churches today here in America, but, 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 but when you get down below the Mason and Dixon line, the attitudes change. It ain't like out in California. Now you got some churches that are doing well, but there's something about the attitude of the people in this part of the country. Yeah. Some people just can't get past the racism and the things that they have been taught growing up. If you have been taught all your life, and I'm getting off point, but I want to make that fair, because some Jews probably was taught like this too, that the Samaritans are inferior to you. You should have nothing to do with them. Well, I mean, I believe in America. People were told that you were in inferior. Amen. And if somebody don't tell you otherwise, you will be engineered to think that. Because what you read about yourself and what people say about you will have an impact on you. And so it's not unusual here that these Jews were experiencing the same problem. And I'm pretty sure there were some, some Samaritans probably felt the same way. Hey, if you think that about me, I don't care. I'm going to think that way about you. So, so he said that Jacob's well was there, so that was a tie that they all had something in common because they could trace their roots back to Jacob. Now, Jesus got tired, but this lets us see his humanity. After a two-day walk, I mean, Jesus got tired. He was weary. So he sat beside the well at noontime. Important there. Now, look at this. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone, so they made it clear. He should have told us that first, but I got to read that so you get the connection. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Now, Jesus being left alone, that was kind of unusual for a rabbi or a teacher of that nature. You know, normally you have disciples around. So now, that was unusual, Jesus by himself. But it was also unusual for a woman to come and draw water at the hottest part of the day. Normally, they would not come out at noon to get water. Another thing that was unusual is that it was not common for women to normally come out by themselves. Normally, they came in a group because that was their assignment, their duty. they go draw the water. And so now this woman got an issue. She out there at the hottest part of the day all by herself. And here Jesus sitting out there by himself. Now, you can just look at that, and if you just got any spiritual mind at all, you don't call that a coincidence. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying, in the spirit. See, in the natural, you say, oh, it's just coincidence. He got tired. No, no. No, because he could have went around. He didn't have to go through. He could have went around. So when you look at this, you got to look at this. Hey, that may be something divine about disappointment. This wasn't just something that just happened. God knew that this was going to happen, and Jesus knew that he had to go through Samaria. Y'all following that so far? So, so it was noontime. So, the, so soon as Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please, he was polite. I, I want y'all to catch his politeness. That's going to shock her too, because for him to say, please give me a drink, you know, the average Jew wouldn't have said please. Amen. <laughs> I know that people get mad at me when I try to make things real and plain like this. But let me show you this. That was a time when folk wouldn't say please to me. Just assume that I don't need to tell you please. I don't need to say thank you. 
That happened before Jesus. But it got something to do with a mindset that can be in people whether they go to church or not. Got something to do with a mindset. So that was a time when a, a young 14-year-old boy would call me boy. And I'm over here. I remember just doing what I thought I was doing, paying for something. And I put my hand out to get my change. And the dude dropped it on the counter. No, he saw my hand. Obviously, there was something about me that made him think that he didn't have to be polite and kind to me. But Jesus wasn't thinking like that. He said to this Samaritan woman, please give me a drink. Y'all get that? Now, I'm pretty sure that was probably the other folks say, just go get me some drink, go fetch Go fetch. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. Help me out right here. Okay, let me read on. because The context here, look at this. He was alone at that time because his wife had gone to the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritan. Why? Well, y'all do your research. Why? Why would they have no dealings? Why would they refuse to have anything to do with Samaritan? She said, look what she said. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? That is not normal behavior. Because I understand the culture, and I understand the environment that I live in. That is not how y'all normally treat us. And now you asking me kindly for a, a drink? Now look at this. Jesus come back from that because now he finna turn her conversation and he's gonna shift it into a spiritual nature and not just his natural, her natural understanding. Look at this, verse 10. It says, Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. Wow. Jesus was saying, hey, you're looking at me in the natural, and you got some things going through your head about how a Jew ought to treat you. And so therefore, because you got those things going through your head, you're not, you're not receiving who I really am. You're more concerned about my ethnicity because I'm a Jew and talking to you instead of seeing me as someone that may have something that can be a benefit to you. Because he replied, if you only knew. When you don't know something, you just, you just don't know. They call that just ignorance. You know, if you don't know, it's just, that's all ignorance. It ain't a bad word. It means just, you just don't know. But when people enlighten you, you're going to have to be willing to open up your mind to get rid of the ignorance. Amen. If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Now here is where she sounds like Nicodemus. You know when Jesus told Nicodemus, hey Nick, you got to be born again. Nick went straight, well hey, I'm old. And hey, that can't happen, I'm old man. How am I going to go back to my mother's womb? This woman heard that, but in her mind, she processed it naturally, in a logical way. And sometimes we come to church, we read God's word, and we process it logically and naturally, and it don't make sense. There's some things in this Bible that we see that God allowed to happen and God caused to happen that don't always make sense to us. But because it don't make sense, don't mean it's not true. Don't mean that God didn't do it. So therefore, we have to accept some things from this word that don't necessarily make sense to our natural man. Because our, our spirit wants to receive it, but our natural man, our natural intellect, will sometimes block what our spirit is trying to receive. Because again, naturally we've been taught certain things and certain principles, and sometimes those principles may go against what God's law says. And so now look at this. 
when Jesus said that. Now look at her answer in verse 11. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. <laughs> You're going to give me some water. And you don't even have nothing to draw the water out with. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And then she flipped from that, talking about the living water and the natural. And besides, she get to her side of her, you know, her issue. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, she, she may she look at this. Yeah, I, I hope y'all getting this. I'm laughing, but I, cause I get this. I understand this. I see this conversation in my mind, man. Besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor who? That's important. Jacob is your ancestor, and he's our ancestor. And I know about him from a natural standpoint. And I'm talking to you in the natural. And now, do you think you're greater than Jacob, who gave us this well? Then she says, how can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoy? Again, her mind is still stuck right there in the natural. And what he was going to be trying to get her to see is that the spiritual water that he had had more to do with her eternal salvation than satisfying a physical need for water at that particular time. So, so Pastor, how do you have that discernment <clears throat> when it comes to the, the, the natural and the spiritual? Because it seems like what the, the lady, the Samaritan lady, is, you know, she's just, she's just talking. You know, and, and, and Jesus sees on a different playing field. So how do you kind of have that discernment you decide between I guess your natural thought process versus your spiritual thought process. Well, you know, it, it's hard. In, in order to get that feeling, someone has to enlighten you. Somebody got to gotta share with you a truth that you don't necessarily know. Jesus is going to continue to have this conversation with this woman. But once that happens, you got to be willing to receive. And even as you start studying God's word for yourself and you start reading and meditating on this word more, there are going to be times when you read this Bible, man, your spirit will speak to you. I'm telling you. I mean, your spirit will speak to you. I can only speak for myself. I can read a passage of scripture that I've read for years, and it don't mean nothing to me. But all of a sudden, one day I can read it again, and it seems like my neck just get tensed up and tight and stuff like that. And I, that's, a, to me, the sign, hey, there's something in this that's deeper than you that you'd have missed the last time you read this. And, and, and so... When we hunger and thirst after righteousness and we want to know God's truth, man, he's going to fill us up. But we got we to gotta be seeking this stuff. We got to want this. We got to want this knowledge of who God is. Because if we don't, then we're going to easily believe the things that we can naturally see and understand in, in our own natural mind. And that's why the argument always, when you hear people talk about certain things in the Bible, we have to accept a whole lot of this Bible by faith. Amen. I mean, we do. And, and because if you eliminate your faith, the Bible said without faith is impossible to please God. And if you're going to come to him, you've got to believe that he is. And so therefore, when, when I read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and it say, in the beginning, God said, let there be light and that what? My natural mind going to say, ain't no way. That ain't, that ain't how, <laughs> that is not how light is made. You don't just say, let there be, and light showed up. Because I'm pretty sure there's some smart people out there say, light comes about because heat stuff running into each other, da 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 That may be true. But the Bible that I believe said God said. Now, if he start causing protons and neutrons to run into each other and light came, that's okay too. If that's what you want to connect it to, but the Bible said, God said, let there be light, and that was. So if you can't get past that first part of Genesis, there's no way you're going to get to the resurrection and all the other stuff in this Bible. If you're still stuck right there, man, talking to you about eternal life and Jesus coming back and being caught up with him, you're going to sit there and say, yeah, there ain't nothing but some nice little story. Some people wrote years ago, and we just recording them, believing it, and writing it down, and passing it on. No, this is true. 
I mean, we, we stand up every Sunday and say, this is my Bible. It is the word of, and either it's the truth or it's a lie. And so I hope I went in a roundabout way, friend, I tried to hit what you was asking, and I hope it made some sense. Because there are a lot of things, and again, I think I said last week when we was talking about Nicodemus, we already believe things that we have not seen. We have been conditioned to believe things. We repeat those stories that we have never heard and never seen really uh, uh, in reality, but someone told us certain things, and we repeated it as though we was already there, always there with them. And so therefore, what I'm trying to say, within us is the capacity to believe things that we have not seen. I always use this simple example, man. Somebody told me that I was born on November 7th. I ain't got no recollection of that. And it could have been a typo. It really could have been the eighth. But they told me the seventh. So I walk around with that truth as if though I was right there to be able to witness it, to understand it when it happened. But because mama told me that and I believe her, if you ask me when I was born, I'm gonna say November the 7th, 1953. And those of you who are old enough to know that there were many midwives messed up a lot of birth certificates. Uh, okay. All right, let me read on. <laughs> I'm just trying to prove the point that you already believe some things that you did not see. It's just a matter of do you want to believe God and you have not seen him. So, so look at this. Jesus replied he, to her, you know, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. Now he's trying to bring it into focus, saying, okay, I am not really talking about natural water. I'm talking about something different. Because if you drink this water, no matter how often you drink it, within a certain period of time, you're going to need more of it. But I'm trying to offer you something that once you get, you won't need. Good God of mine. Look, he says, but those who drink the water that I give will never be thirsty again. It's beco it becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Now he gives some idea of what he was alluding to. Say, what I'm offering you is going to have something to do with your eternal salvation. This water that I'm giving you. And, and, and therefore, once you receive this, then now you don't have to worry about where you're going to spend eternity. You don't have to worry about your everlasting life. This is something beyond your thirsting for water again and the natural. This is something that's talking about where you're going to end up spiritually. And so look at what she says. Please, sir, verse 15, the woman said, give me this water. Then I will never be thirsty again. She's still in the natural. And I won't have to come here to get. She said, man, you're going to make my life easy. You're going to make my life easy. Tomorrow at noon, I ain't going to have to leave all the women that hate me back in the city and come out here and get no water because you done gave me some water I'm going to have her. And so with that being said, she was looking and understanding things in her natural mind when Jesus was talking about spiritual things. Now, even though she made that comment, Jesus did not, you know, didn't come back out and call it, you know, you just, you, you dummy. You know, kind of like Red, you say, dummy? He said, you, come on, dummy, you got to be, you, come on, you got to get that. That's simple. You got to get that. He didn't do that, he didn't do that. Jesus just shifted the conversation so that he can draw it into a deeper conversation with himself. But now, kind of talking about her personal life and, 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 and not so much about the living water, but now about how she was living. So in verse 16, you know, the conversation abruptly changed. Look at this. Go and get your husband. Now, how in the world we go from water and not being thirsty no more? And this dude done jumped all the way over into my, <laughs> into my personal life. 
I mean, how, how in the world go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Now look at this. She came back. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, what? You're right. Pastor, you, can I say what I got to say before I get back into the desk? Go ahead. Because uh, he was touching the nerve because, see, modern kids these days use dirty, not only about water. They talk about all kind of things, whether they're talking about people, whether they're talking about money, whether they're talking about materialism. So Jesus touched the nerve where she was dirty there because he ain't got there yet, but she did have five husbands, and the man she's with ain't her husband. So she was thirsty. Y'all heard it from Anthony at first. I mean, but uh, but but I, I would I would imagine that I made that. I, I would I <laughs> Well I do hear that I do that I do hear that terminology a lot when I'm out there looking at Netflix and stuff like that. They be talking about people being thirsty. It took me a while to catch on to it too, because I thought they were talking about water. I was I was talking thinking natural and they, and they was <laughs> thinking maybe spiritual in another way. Thirsty. But I, I get you, Anthony, I see what you're saying. So now, so he shifted the conversation and tell her to go get a husband. And, uh, and then he said, she said, I don't have a husband. The one replied, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Now, even though he just shot in the forehead, he did, because you know he hit a nerve right there. I mean, I mean, I didn't come to hit out. We were talking about water. But he did, Jesus did say, you did tell the truth. You didn't lie. You didn't tell it all, but you didn't lie. Because, you know, you say, hey, you're right. You don't have a husband. But Jesus going there past and said, look, you don't have five. Man, that's, that's a lot of marrying right there. Amen. And I know we're living in a time now where divorces come quick and easy. Used to be a time you had to work for them. You couldn't just haul off and go get a little package and fill it out in 10 days and take it back with $400 and you're done. You, you, man, used to be a time you had to go through a lot. I mean, but now it's so easy. Man, we done minimize the, you know, marriage down now to it's just a, a, a temporary stop on the way to four or five other folk. I'm serious. I mean, not all people. Don't, I don't want to generalize that. But in our culture, just look out and see what the divorce rates are like among our culture. And not just people that are not saved. I'm talking about people in the, in the church. So we can't laugh at this woman. She may not have had five. But I would venture to say half of the people in the church have been married at least once or twice. And, and he said, you had five. Y'all got real quiet right there. Don't, we don't, where you, I'm just, let me, let me be, y'all, don't get quiet over like that. When y'all get quiet like that, that scared me, man. Don't, y'all say amen. Say something, Major. Give me some feedback. I'm just trying to read the Bible and try to make it plain. But look here. You have had five. That may be why she was coming to the well by herself. You know, you can read and kind of you know, draw your own narrative that if you'd have been married five times in a little village, you know, this wasn't no major city. You know, it was a small village town. So she probably done took somebody's husband. It's a good possibility. I mean, you'd have been married five times. I mean, you. It's a good. That, that it, it, it let Bolden use his imagination. That may be why she was running by herself. She ain't had no friend. The other women maybe didn't want to hang with her. Because I get close to you. I'm just making up my own story right here. Y'all just bear with me. But if I get too close to you, you may end up with my husband. They had to come from somewhere. Oh, Lord, help me. Later, you the scholar, man, so if I'm off base, just come back and get me. help me out later on. But I, right down my work with that, because Jesus said, you've had five of them. 
and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. Wow. I don't know what that, that don't even apply to the day because you know, you know, used to be a time you, before you lived, before you got married. But now that, you know, we live in a culture now, but that ain't a big deal no more. That's not a deal breaker. Hey, you want to just for convenience sake, let's just we live together. Let's do that. Okay, fine. I mean, that's what's happening. <laughs> Brother Herb, I hope they got you on the mic when you said on, online. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Brother Herb. Just the way um, how Jesus is trying to introduce himself, introduce himself to why he's here. And, and as you say, he's trying to explain to the point where the flesh is, the flesh, your body always don't want water. You always don't come to the well to get this, to feed your, to feed your flesh. And now, I'm gonna tell you that I'm gonna talk spirit in your life. That that you keep hunger and thirsty for the wrong thing, and that's why you got five husbands because you keep looking and trying to get that thirst for your life. And and that's where he's trying to um, get to her to understand in the spiritual realm and be able to prophesy, not prophesy, but actually tell about herself that she keep looking and being thirsty for this husband that she can't be satisfied with. Okay. I, about I, her life. I, and, I, I, and, I, and, and, and he's going to get to, to, to understand that if you continue to look for that wrong thing, you're looking in the wrong place. And that's what he's trying to let her know. That she's going to keep on doing this. And um, it's not going to satisfy thirst. So, yeah. Okay. Amen. Amen. Any, any other comments before I move on? That's a, good, that's a good point. That's a good comment. Good comment. Any other comment? So, hey, 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 Pastor. Hey, Pastor. Finley, okay, I'm sorry, man. Yeah, my, my bad. Um, when he was talking about the five husbands and whatnot, is this referring to actual, like, husbands, like, you got married, or is it referring to a person, people who he has sex with? See, see, during the Bible times, you were taught that if you had sex, you were married. It was understood that sex outside of marriage, God didn't like. So here husband means somebody that she was married to. And you know, when studying the law, it wasn't uncommon when Jesus confronted the Pharisees, say, you know, because the culture was set up, it was a male-dominated culture. So in the Old Testament, God never intended for folks to get divorced like that, just, just drop a hat, just change wives and move on. But apparently in Moses' day, some of the brothers back there weren't satisfied. They wanted to trade them off like cows or something. Just go get a new one. You get tired of them, go get another one. And Jesus said, look here, from the beginning, God never intended it to be like that. But because the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to do something that God, so he allowed the men to write divorce decrees to their wives. And that was common because the women could not do that. They didn't have that type of right. They didn't have that type of authority. You know, they was not, they was kind of looked at like second class citizens. So here, when Brother Herb go back and said, hey, this woman now have had five and you aren't even married. Well, Finley, that almost kind of answered our question right there, don't you? <laughs> this next sentence almost answer your question. You aren't even married to the man you're living with now. And then he tell us, you certainly spoke the truth. Now, I know the culture that we live in, marriage, like I said before, I don't know, I, I need a young person in here, someone that's, you know, under 40, 35 or less. I don't know, how, how does this culture see marriage? You know, because when I look at what's being fed into the young people's mind, marriage is not glorified no more. Not on either side. I mean, I look at stuff and see people say, hey, 
Women out there, hey, feel like, hey, I don't want to be attached, you know, to nobody. You know, I'm going to have my own play dates. <laughs> and, 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 you know, they got a name for it. I can't say the name. I heard it on TV. I had to go look it up uh, on the Urban Dictionary what that means, you know. But they got a name. You know, used to be a time it was just guys who would think like that. I don't want to be tied to one woman, so therefore I'm going to just play the field. And if I can have a lady for every night of the week, then okay, that's cool. Well, that mindset done flipped. There are ladies out there who think just like that now. If they can play that game that way, we can do it too. And so I would be interested to see the, how is marriage valued now? In the circles that you run in, do people even talk about getting married anymore like that? Is that a goal? Is that an aspiration? When I was coming up, that was a goal, man. You thought that once you get a certain age, you're supposed to get married. I mean, it was just automatically thinking that. I never thought I was going to be single all my life. And by 19, I started thinking about, hey, since I wasn't going to college, I was thinking, hey, I need to get married because I'm already doing the thing that married folks do. But I didn't think about, hey, I got to keep doing that without getting married. I think I, I need to get. Now, I was, at that time, I didn't know I was ignorant, dumb. I had a hard time trying to narrow the field down. But I didn't have a big field to play in. So don't get me wrong, I wasn't no player like that. Because let me, I, I think I done told y'all like this. Ladies that dad had about seven, eight brothers, them boys were serious. So I knew I wasn't going to treat her any kind of way. So I, I, I loved Lady Jeanette. Once her, once her brothers knew that I loved her, then hey, they knew that I was going to do right by her. Now I may be messing, talking to somebody over here, but they know at the end of the day. And they had told me, if you do anything <laughs> to hurt my sister, you know, so I knew marriage was in the cards for me. But now I ask that question again. How do the culture that we live in now see marriage? Finley, you're the guy I need to be here. You help me out, Finley. I need your help right here. Jonel, why do y'all help me out? Some of y'all young people, come on, come on, just talk to me. Let's have, we got a couple of minutes. We can have a conversation. <laughs> Go ahead, Brother Herb. What, what I hear they would say, we don't need a piece of paper. Okay. We don't need a piece of paper. So. In other words, man wants you to have a piece of paper so we can just. Yeah, we don't need a piece of paper. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, they do commitment ceremonies now? So you don't go to courthouse and get no legal paper, you just commit each other to each other. Okay. I didn't know that. I don't no. know if it's legal. I know in, when I was coming up now, after seven years, they used to call it common law. In Alabama, you know, I, I don't know if it's still like that, but if you stay with somebody seven years, whether you're married or not, you have about four or five kids, then that's considered a common law marriage. You give some right. Now, they made them took those laws off the books now. But you'll never <laughs> commitment. Say, I ain't never heard that. Yes, ma'am. I would say um, marriage is viewed from, at least from my generation of millennials, uh, more of a con, um, more as a... You say a con? A con. Like a C-O-N con? Yeah. A con, a con. game? When it comes to at least men, it's a financial con, where they're, I guess they're already thinking about divorce before they even, they think about like child support or alimony or whatever it may cost them if the marriage doesn't work. Um, marriages are more, have diver divorce rates like what, 50% or higher. So yeah. they're already thinking about the end while they're preparing for the beginning and then it's also looked at as a um, visual thing. Um, the wedding is more important than the actual marriage. The looks of things, the aesthetic of things is valued more than the actual marriage. What you have to do to keep that marriage, um, like the work you have to do to keep the wow. marriage. Wow. Yeah, that's just what it is. Wow. Okay. Brother Al, you the guru now. How, what, what, how did that line up with what you teaching out there? I'm just asking, I'm just asking. Uh, 
That's 39 years. I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> okay, okay. That's a good. That's a good. That's a good deflection. Get out of that thing. You best sit right there by. You better answer that like that. <laughs> hey, 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 but, boss. but I'm just talking about what Finley. Go ahead, because this, this is interesting to me. I, I, you know, Jonelle, are you gonna talk or Finley gonna talk? No, I was just gonna say there are also. Um, I know some people who would rather have a baby by themselves than to deal with a man. I've actually heard a woman say that before, but she went through some things. No excuse, but she went through a lot. Now she's just like, I'd rather have a baby by myself. I didn't judge her, but people think like that. Wow. Wow. Man, back in the day, I guess, see, uh, different is, see, you know, if you got an education now and you're working, back in the day, women didn't think like that. Because they didn't have no job most of the time. I mean, back, I'm just saying back in the day. I'm saying back in the day. So, so they, they, it, the, the, the roles have changed. Now, I'm just, back in my day, when my mom was coming up, my daddy was the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. On the insurance policy, they called him the breadwinner. They didn't even insure the women because they knew they weren't working to make no money. So the man who's the breadwinner. So in that mindset, the women felt like they needed a man and a piece of a man was better than no man. I used to hear my auntie I'm saying that, a piece of man, a piece of man. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm just telling I, I heard that now. I, I'm just telling my experience. Piece hey, of man. Right now. Sister Robin. I can ahead. bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan, and make him believe. What's the rest of that? Oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah. I, I, I agree with what you're saying. With, with the... Uh, with the onset of the women's movement, like you said, roles begin to reverse. And so what they say is two can play that game. And now because women have, you know, they are breadwinners, they can provide for themselves. So if the man doesn't know what to do with the woman, then she'd rather be without him. You know, y'all, I think y'all studying something that says when you don't know the purpose of a thing, then what do you do? You abuse it. You abuse it, yeah. Amen. Amen. Sister, that's a good point. You y'all on the same sheet of music? Yes, she just kind of summed up exactly because um, right now black women are more educated than our black males, unfortunately. So we are bringing in more of the money. We are the breadwinner. Source and look, but I just don't know if the roles have changed. I think men want to be considered the breadwinner of the house and run it all. And okay. Right now, that's not happening. All right. So, is there, is, and again, in, in the culture now, is there unwritten rules that is it okay to marry down or up or whatever it is that, you know, you, I mean, you, you, don't, you got your four year degree, you know, you're a PhD, you making six figures, and you just run upon this guy that you love, but he only make 50K. He only make 50K. You know, he, he, he just a manager at a Wendy's. And he making 50K. But you love the dude. Do, do, can you marry down? Can you go down? Or you gotta, you gotta come up a little bit higher than the 50K? You see, that makes a difference? Cause Jonelle, I see you move your head. Let me hear what your mouth got to say. Finley, go ahead. Well, well Jonelle just said he gotta keep going. That's, that, that's what she said. Okay. But uh, I guess the response to your you know, comment slash question, you know, I, it's one of those deals that, you know, it's more about, it sounds like sometimes more about the, the, the gift versus the, the generosity, you know. Um, you know, about, about the actual man's character. Does he, is he actually doing his purpose? You know, he doesn't have to have on, I guess, all this, you know, I guess, uh, name brand. The, the aesthetic looks good, you know, and whatnot. You know, obviously it looks good, but at the end of the day, you know, the aesthetic go, goes away. So the, inter the interior man of your own self is what's going to last with her, you know. Um, so, um. Uh, with, with the comment you're saying, marry, marry up and marry down, you know, and it's, 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 I think it's one of those, uh, maybe those psychological things, or it's kind of like that human mindset, the natural mindset and whatnot, but in the day, you know, you could, when the marriage, you got two, you got the, two, you got the one not that ties together, that's the word of God, you know, so if you got, if you, if you going, if you holding the, if you, if you going by that, you know, that, that's not how God views, view, views you, you know what I mean, he don't view you as, you know, greater or greater or least. In fact, he actually wants you to pour into the to, to the poor, to be honest with you. 
And so, um, so that's, that's the way I view it right there. But I think the common answer we get from the majority of other women, you know, it's like, you know, he can be working on Wendy's, but he gotta do more. He gotta, but you know, by the end of the day, you know, that, that, if that's his walk and he's a good man and he's, and he's, and he's pouring into what he needs to pour into, all that other, you know, growing and growing, you know, it's, it's a good thing. But hey, you know, well, if he's pouring what you need, you know, hey, you, your gas tank big, and you can still drive. <laughs> Brother Herb, I'm feeling y'all, y'all making me laugh tonight. I tell you what, I'm getting educated here tonight. Go ahead. Well, the thing is, today things have changed to the point where you know we need to know the purpose of a, of a marriage. And now where we at in our culture in this nation, it has changed. Now you can have same sex. Same-sex marriage now. Yeah, I mean, now that's a whole different subject, Dad. But, but, but I understand you that's about, reality. We're that's real. About marriage now. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, up and down on how you look at marriage, but okay. I'm just saying that it has changed because do we do we do we really know what it looks like now? So the definition is, has changed. Well, I, for me, yeah. I'm just I can only speak for Larry Bowden. I, I still believe in the original definition, you know, but I, I ain't, I'm not hating on nobody who believe in other definitions. I just go by the definition in the book, and I believe that the guy who wrote the book ought to, and, and ordained something ought to figure out how it ought to work. But, you know, love now is thrown around that as long as you love a person, it shouldn't matter, da, 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 and I'm not going to argue that point. But I'm just saying my viewpoint. I believe that the Bible says marriage between a man and a wolf man. Now, I ain't got no problem with our culture and all that. I don't have no problem with names that people say, if you want to be a he, she, they, their, other, or whatever you, I don't care. Tell me what you want to be called. If you want to be called purple, I'm going to call you by your name. You'll give whatever you say your given name is. But purple, I'm sorry. If I know you are a girl purple, I ain't going to call you he or whatever. I'm going to call you or I'm going to just call you purple. And don't try to make me call you something other than purple. Because we're going to let's agree with disagree with that and I'm going to call you purple. But I'm not going to play the pronoun with you and all that. I just ain't got the time. Too old to be playing pronouns. I learned, I learned English and everything now and pronoun one way. I ain't trying to learn a new way, so just tell me your name. Whatever you want me to call you, okay. I'll call you by your name. The only thing I'm addressing to you, Pastor, you said, what is the definition? You know, you, you really went through saying what marriage looks like now. Yeah. As long as you're saying that. Okay? I, I know that's a whole new different subject, but, but, but I'm just saying, today, what it looks, what marriage looks like. Amen. Amen. You know, Pastor, uh, me and El was talking, and we were talking about, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the institution of marriage. It's that our values have changed. I mean, the, the institution of marriage works if you, if you go by the book. But when we start inserting how we feel, and I don't love you, you know, and about the whole money thing, what are you marrying for? Are you marrying for money or are you marrying for love? Yeah, I, you know, I was hearing people talk and say, you know, I hear people talk say, man, uh, I, you know, even hear a lot of love no more, you know, I don't, I don't feel connected. <laughs> what? <laughs> I guess that's a new way of saying, look here, man, I, I mean, you know, I love you, but I ain't in love with you. And I don't, I, when people you say that, that do, I could, what does that mean? You love me, but you ain't in love with me. So it means you head to the divorce court. So I tell people, when you hear somebody tell you, I don't feel connected and you marry, that's a bad word to be here. I don't feel connected. Because they about to unconnect you. Pastor, we feel like the, the God of love never excludes. But if we look at society today, you know, anybody could get married and be divorced in the next minute because right about now people married until they find a cause. The cause, he might be, she might snort too loud or he might do this and this and that. 
they're not willing to put in the, the, the effort and the, the work it takes to make it right. You know, this is a long-term thing. You know, and, and people don't respect that about these days. So now, instead of giving it back, you know, I just have my thing and he have his thing and, you know, and that's how it is in society. Everything is changing, you know. So those that are married have to step forward and really have to show the younger per people or those who tended to get married, you know, how valuable it is and, and, and it still works. Because now you have a lot of people saying, well, what's the point of getting married when I'm looking at all these so-called married people miserable or getting divorced? Yeah. Okay, but what about those that have to be married? Yeah. You know? Yeah, you're going to have your ups and downs. But are you willing to put in that, you know, that work it takes, you know, if you really... So. Okay, yeah. good. And l l let me read on. Let me read because I want to get to a certain point. Brother Herb, I hope you can hold. Let me read, make, this, make this point before yeah, I forget it. I was it. just going to say that uh, before you get married, you, you really need to know what marriage is all about. It's not the, you know, the uh, destination wedding and then the happily ever after. You have to understand, like, like Wayne said, you have to, you have to work at your, your marriage. Yeah. You know, dating is, is different from living with someone. Amen. And having Amen. children and all of that. So, all those change the equation. <laughs> go ahead, brother. Herb. You you go go ahead. The thing I want to say is go back to the study. This is what Jesus is is dealing with right now. He's 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 telling her. He's showing her to get it right. And that, but that's what's happening right now. He's talking to her right now, and he's coming to the scene. We got it wrong. We got it wrong. And she got it wrong. And he's getting changed to begin to let her know that she's looking in the wrong direction. He said, he said, he said the course now. Hey Amen. And, and, and that's that's a good that's a good that's a good jumping off point because that'll go back to what he's saying. You know, when he said to the lady in verse 18, I'm gonna read real quick through 19 and on, he said, You certainly spoke the truth. And then once he said that and finished his comment, then the woman says, Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. All of a sudden, what Brother Herbert said come into focus. I'm not just talking to some average dude out here. This dude knows some things about me that I didn't think not a whole lot of other folk know. And I just met him at this well today. And all of a sudden, he done, he done did the roll count and got all the names from my five husbands. Then he know how I'm living right now. And, and that got her attention. So now, from this natural conversation, she flipped that script and says this in verse 20. So tell me. Now he's talking about her life and she go but get spiritual and say, look here. Tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the, that ain't got nothing to do with what I just said. But that's deflection. You know, sometimes you're talking to people you hear the nerve, they, they shift gears on you. You want to know, how do we get over there? Look at this. So tell me, why do you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship? While we Samaritans claim it is here on Mount Gershom, where our ancestors worship, Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. In other words, the realm of worship, the realm of worship is no longer going to be so much about a geographical uh, location as it is about where your heart is when you're in that worship moment. And so he said, now, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship because they, weren't, they didn't have privy to all the writings of the prophet. They were only familiar with the first five books of the, of, of, the, of the Old Testament, the law. So they didn't know about all the prophetic things that were said. So they didn't have a full understanding. He says, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. And that's always been said. Even Paul wrote that that you know, the Jews got knowledge of God first, and because they got that knowledge of God first, they were supposed to share that knowledge with everybody else. But a lot of them did not do that, and so therefore, God always had a plan that the Gentiles were gonna get this word too. And it was always in the plan, but the original intent was for the Jews to be that example, that light, to bring everybody to him. He says, but the time is coming indeed, it is here now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In spirit, again, that, that, that 
that part of you that's immaterial part of you, that part of you that God breathes into. And again, that goes back to what we learned about the first, very first book in the, in the Bible, in Genesis, when it said God breathed life into this mound of dirt. And, and Adam became a living being or a living soul. So therefore, we have to all believe that there's a spiritual part of us. And other religions believe in, a spirit, in, the, in spirituality. So there is a spiritual part of you, and that's the part of you that God got to communicate with when it comes to your understanding of him. Because the natural part of you and the fleshly part of you and all that may not always understand what God is trying to say. So he said, now look, I gotta, we got to get to the point where we worship God in spirit and in truth. In other words, you're going to have to have a sincere heart and be genuine when you come to God and worship. And you can do that no matter where you are. You don't have to be here striving or in any other church to do that. We fellowship with one another because the Bible tells us to do that. But when it comes to worship, worship is more than just what we do here on Sunday. Your worship experience can take place between here in your home and your car when you leave here tonight. You can get in that mindset that, hey, I'm going to just communicate, spend some time with God after this Bible study because that was a point that was said that's sticking with my spirit right now. And look, here, on my way home, me and God are going to deal with this. So you leave here and your worship experience don't have to die when you walk out the door. It can continue on because God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Then look at this. This is what I call the great reveal. The woman said, I know, so she has some knowledge, the Messiah is coming. The one who is called Christ. Some believe maybe John the Baptist's word had got all the way over there to them. Some believe that they may have had a revelation from some of the things that was passed down from their ancestors. It's hard to say. But then she says, when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus flat out tell her who he is, which Brother Herb was getting at earlier. He was bringing her to this point so he could reveal himself to her so that she could have a better understanding of who she was talking to and how important that conversation or this, 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 this encounter would be in her life. Jesus said to her, I am the Messiah. That was one of the first time he ever made a clear declaration of who he was. He made that to her before he made it to a lot of Jews. So that let us know that Jesus did not see this woman as just a Samaritan who was hated by the Jews. He saw her as someone who needed to know the truth of the gospel and who needed to be saved. So going back to what Brother Herb said, hey, you know, you got all them, you got all them husbands, and now you're living one that ain't, ain't your husband, and da-da-da-da-da, and all that. Say, so now you got time to get some of this, uh, this living water that can help you make some adjustments. Y'all following that so far? Okay, now look at this. Now, after Jesus tell her that, the lady get happy. Now, you know, she done got a revelation. You know, when, you, when the Lord reveals some things to you, your spirit changed, man. You know, when you get an understanding of God's word and it settles down in your spirit, man, your attitude changed about this word. And so now this lady got a revelation. And once she got it, she wanted to share it with somebody. Now, look at this. Just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman because they was kind of thinking like, you know, they were still Jews. <laughs> they really shocked because you talking to this Samaritan woman. You, just, you hear at this well by yourself with this woman? You know that ain't supposed to be. That ain't how the law got. You ain't supposed to be by yourself, Rabbi, with no woman. So instead of them seeing him ministering to this lady, they got caught up in what the law was, the tradition was. And sometimes we allow tradition and man-made laws to hinder us from being able to minister to people. He says... But none of them, I like this, had the nerve to ask her, what, are you, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? Now look at what the woman did, and again, I told you God can use whoever he will to spread his word. The woman left her water jar. Now that was the whole purpose that she was coming to the well. How do you leave your purpose that you came to the well at the well? I mean, she, she came to get water, but now she done got a taste of this living water, and her mind is no longer on the natural water. I came out here with a jar on my, on my shoulders. Now I met this man at the well, and I forgot all about that. All because he told me some things about myself that I thought knew, nobody else knew about. 
ran back to the village telling everyone, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this possibly be the Messiah? So she kind of asked that question with, to appeal to their curiosity. Some believe that the reason she didn't just say, come see the Messiah right away, because of her reputation. Nobody would believe, man, come on, who's going to believe you? You can't even keep a husband. You ain't got no credibility. You can't even keep a husband. And then you live with a dude right now, ain't even your husband. Your testimony can't be worth nothing. See, sometimes people can have a testimony even in the middle of their mess. Can I say something, Pastor? Brother, why you go ahead? Okay. When I look at that, right, first of all, it was at noontime. It was hot. And she went up there for water. But this woman was overwhelmed. Not only overwhelmed, but she had that love that entered. She left that water, and she went back telling the people, how many of us went back to the people who we don't slept with or mess around with and tell them about the gospel? See, when you experience a personal encounter with that man, it don't matter, that love overcomes, and you will go spread the word. How many of us have a call friends who we did wrong and spread the gospel? That's the power of salvation. That's the power of love. Wow. Wow, I ain't hear nobody answer that one, Wayne. Maybe somebody online, maybe somebody online say, yeah, that's a good point, Wayne. I'm gonna go ahead and call everybody I've slept with and say, tell them I have found Jesus now. <laughs> I'm saying that because I, I, I was convicted. Saying. Yeah. When I really looked at that, I was convicted. I, and I did. Those who I can remember, those who are, you know, I did. Yes, I did. But how many, you know? But that's, that's, that's when you look at the, and you understand the revelation, and you look at the word different. But when you truly, when you put that love in you, that love overcome, you just want to tell them. If they receive it, they receive it. They don't have to receive it. You did your job. Amen. Amen. So, so Wayne, even though it don't say it here, you there's a good possibility she went back to them five dudes. Guess what? I went to get some water. And I met a man. He even knew about you. He I'm helped looking at it with reputation and not receiving the message. Amen. Amen. Wayne, you got me sweating up here, man. I didn't know this lesson was going to be this hot tonight. I thought I was going to breathe through this and get to 38. But anyway, let me go on. That's a good point. Something to think about. Because I do, I do believe a lot of people sit down on their real testimony. We, we really only share part of our real testimony. We don't let people really know the real <laughs> testimony. And that's why I said on Sunday, man, if you're married, man, you got to, you uh, finna get married, you got to give up the real testimony, man. You got to get it all out there. So, so she can they handle it. Because they may not, be, yeah, they need to know the truth. The truth makes them free. And then, everything, I mean, you got, so, so, <laughs> I mean, so, so, you, so you're getting ready to get married. And so you, you sit down and you go, hey, it's some things that I need to tell you. Well, they, they might can't handle that. And, and there's some things that she might say that I might can't handle or even want to know. I say, let's go from right here. We love each other. <laughs> There's, there's, why, 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 rehash, why, why rehash all of that? I mean, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. What's the point? Hey, Pastor did say no, no, she wanted to be persistent to get the past. No, <laughs> but, but I'm saying, I'm saying, what's, what's the point? What's the point in rehashing all of that for one of you to bring up six months later and say, I can't believe you had all the parts. I mean, what's the, what's the, I mean, and what does that solve? What is that? Why? why? Why would you bring up all the mess? So, and then now you got me thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> I would have never thought. <laughs> I mean, but what's the point in that? You, you know L, what I mean? L, L, what is the, pro the prevailing win now, you know, in the marriage world? They say, leave it alone. Don't, don't, don't. But, but when y'all sit down and you have these interviews with your future wife or husband, and y'all do the little background on each other, don't they ask some serious questions in there? They don't say tell it all. Okay, okay. I mean, they, they may can't handle it all. Okay. So you ought to at least tell her the things that could pop up so she don't be surprised. Like what? 
Like, you know, you still. <laughs> Pastor. I mean, Pastor, we're, do, we're, do together. You? We're, we're together now. Our past is our past. Okay, let me ask you. If we're moving forward, then we're moving forward. Would you say, Sonny, that the, the front mirror uh -huh. is big? Is that big for a reason? That little mirror in the back is small for a reason? How important? So, 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 so the point here is that, okay, so when you, when you are having this conversation with your, your future wife, whatever, do you think she should have access to your phone and you have access to her phone? I'm just asking a question. Well, yeah, because now we, we've cleaned things up. Okay, well, you don't took them all out. Okay. Yeah, and, and we're honest now. I okay. mean, you, you shouldn't be having, you know, still dudes that you dated 10 years ago still in your phone. Why, I mean, why are you still calling them? But I'm saying to sit down and go, hey, you know, it's some things that that I should tell you, but I don't feel comfortable because I don't think that you can handle that. Okay. And and like the same thing for her. She may tell you some stuff where you might say, whoa. <laughs> but the point, my point is, why why is that necessary? The past is the past. Okay. It's a born again marriage. It's a born it's a born again marriage. Born again marriage. You know, I uh, as I was I was going to a class, and we came to this point to understanding about sexuality, and also we understand to a point that uh, uh, being a virgin, male and female, and it came to a point the question about uh, to me was to each other, were you a virgin? And I go, no, as we study. And as we study about that, that's the way God intended for us to be as we study. Now the question is, the question is, can you still, is it, is it still too late to be a virgin? Wait a minute, wait a minute, let me finish. <laughs> let, let me finish, bro. To, to a point, to the point where the understanding of you, to a point where now you ask me to repent understand, you know, to God to let him know that I violate that. And at the same time, the question was asked for us, could you go and ask for repentance to your wife and actually sit down and tell her that, that I was not and I'm asking for you of forgiveness that I was not that. And Personally, I did. I had to sit down and do that. That freed me to a point to understand what came in the past to to get to get you know to a point where you know we'll say, well, God forgave everything of my you know about my past. He said he forgives your sins, but I'm saying to a point where it came to just sexuality is about being a virgin in a sense, where there's a wife that I have married. Then it, it came more in personal. I did, and then it was it was it was more a revelation. I mean, a freedom that I had for me to move forward. And that's all. Okay. So yes, I, it was, and a lot of people can't handle that because I asked that question in front of my <laughs> friends before. I mean, not my friends, my brothers, and I've mentioned it to them, and uh, that's something that's a challenge to be able to do that. So Amen. yes, um, but no, let me say this one thing about the woman. It's something about when somebody knows about you. And, it's, and he's saying it to me when Jesus knows, God knows me. He was excited that somebody knows me, know all about me. And that's something that he, he revealed to her. And she was excited that she know, he knows me. But couldn't he be the Messiah? Amen. So that's all I'm saying. So she was excited. Amen. Sis, go ahead. Good point. Red mic. Is it on? So um, I guess kind of a question off of what he was saying, it, it would be <coughs> wise to uh, discuss past 
relationships or experiences to kind of evolve from that. Because some people have had past relationships where it was a lesson or they had experienced some trauma experience. So you would, I guess, experience that or uh, discuss that with your partner so you guys can evolve when it comes to going through marriage so you know your partner, spouse's previous triggers, traumas, etc. I'm, I'm assuming is that what you're trying to say, like in a way? I, 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 think, I, I think that's what, I think what Brother Herb is saying that too, because a lot of times people do have certain things in, in their past. You know, I was counseling a couple one time and I think it was just a way that when they were in the bed, you know, one would, you know, normally they slept, you know, kind of facing each other, whatever. And then, you know, at certain times, you know, all of a sudden you sleep with your back to me or something like that. And from a previous time, that was a bad signal because that was a sign that whenever that person did that, something was wrong in the relationship. Now the new person don't even know that. They're just sleeping on the side they like sleeping on. All of a sudden now, that's the issue because the person may think, hey, you upset with me, or you're mad at me or something like that when it's not, not known. But I can understand what Major is saying too. I, I think wisdom may have to come in and know how much you think your future wife can handle. I mean, like you say, can they handle that? You know, I don't know where that line is for everybody, but I do think you need to try to reveal enough about you to so that that person is not shocked with no new revelation after y'all done got married. I mean, if you know that there's a deal break out there, if she stumbled up on that, and all of a sudden she said, if I had known that, man, I wouldn't even got to this point with you, then, you know, I, you got to weigh that. I don't know what, what's the right answer for everybody. I, I can tell you in my general, we didn't ask those type questions, Major, when I got, I was 19. So we wouldn't no long sit down, you know, have no conversation about past. You know, Lady Jeanette had just had flea. She was two months, you know, old and all that. So, me, you know, it was different. So we didn't sit down and talk about past relationship. You know, I, we were 19. You know, and for me, you know, we were just 19. <laughs> and so now if you maybe get married at 30, because people get married later now, you may have some, some history out there that you need to deal yeah. with. I think that it, you know how the word says that you should work out your own salvation. So when things come up, little bumps in the road, it's not like you, you sit and have a one-time confessional and tell everything that you ever did. But as things come up in your life, like she was saying, we're spiritual beings and our past relationships will feed into who we are today, even though we don't really understand that. So when something comes up, then as the Bible says, he went in to her and he knew his wife, your wife, or your, your husband needs to know that you're going through certain things because of something. So, so yeah, share it like that. But not just going in and say, hey, let me tell you everything that I ever did and scare her. <laughs> Let Jesus do that, huh? Let Jesus tell <laughs> you, know, you everything. <laughs> you know, just kind of do it as, it as it comes up. And it's something, you know, when God brings something up to the surface and you have to repent of it, then it's something that you want to share with God. You know, Amen. you ask God to fix it. Jonelle, I see your hand. We ain't going to finish tonight. I'll see that right now. I thought I was going to get further with it. I'm, I'm going to mark this right here, 29 or so. We're going to pick up that next week, and we'll tear this conversation on. But go ahead, Jonelle. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, if you talk about your non-negotiables in the beginning, then some of those things may come up. Then you won't be surprised in oh. a way. Like, go on ahead and say, like, have you ever, have you ever, you know what I'm saying? Like, just go ahead and talk about, like, your non-negotiables. Like, if I find out you did this, that's it. Or something like that. I'm jetting up out of here. Okay, I got you. Well, no. <laughs> if I find out, you see, you see, that's it. You say that's a non-negotiable. No, because you know how Miss Robin was saying, like, you don't have to just share everything in the beginning. So what I'm saying is, if you, as the other person, if you go ahead and ask that person, like your, like you know, like your non-negotiables and things like that, maybe some of that stuff that they're kind of keeping to themselves will just come out when Amen. you ask those questions. Amen. Amen. Give, give us an example. Of no, no, don't go there. We ain't got time. Hold that, hold that example the next week. We ain't got time. Give us, give us an example of like, say, hey, this is a deal breaker for me. Oh yeah. Okay, so, all right then, Junior. Oh. Okay. So like, say for instance, um, 
Do you have a baby out there that I need to know about? Have you been with the opposite sex? You get what Ooh. I'm saying? Like some people hold that stuff in. Ooh. You need to talk about it. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. A, ba a baby is a deal breaker? No, I'm saying if that's your non negotiable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. If, 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 but she said that's a non-negotiable. If non-negotiable, non you, 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 yeah. you got a couple babies like that. She said, hey, man, you, 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 know, you get scratched. That's not negotiable. No, no, no. I ain't finna marry no baby mama drama. No. It can be for some women. Yeah, Just no. like, depends on the person. Major, major, let her finish, major, major, let them cook. It can be for some women. You just have to um, go ahead and express that in the beginning. You guys are always on the same terms. And I guess to add to that is some people have a non-negotiable of even if you have a child, are you in that child's life? Are you a deadbeat father? Or are you just going to talk? What? How is that dynamic between you and that baby mother? Or, how, you know, like some things like that are non-negotiables that need to be discussed. And so, and so... That non-negotiable works both ways. Would you think the same if you had a child? Correct, correct. So you would think the same way. I feel like if I had a male and, and I was a baby mama, he wouldn't know the dynamic between me and my baby father. Like, yeah. how are y'all co-parenting? Is it too close? Is it, you know, like what's going on? So I think that's a non-negotiable for men too. How close are you to your baby father and how is that agreement set up? Oh, no, no, I would say if you had a child, of course your mindset would be different. So you, you wouldn't think, okay, well, hey, I expect you not to have children, because to me, that's not negotiable. But if you had a child, that would be different. No, I don't think that's what they're saying, Major. No, no, I'm, I'm just asking. Oh, you just asked. Okay, you, you're probing. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay. That, that's not what they're saying, Major. That, that's not what they're saying. <laughs> okay, Major. Okay, okay. Hey, look, it's, it's 730. We're done. We're done. We got to stop right here. We're done. We're done. It's 730. It's 730. I know this is good. Well, good. Well, oh, you feel like what? <laughs> hey, Pastor, think about courting versus uh, dating. Just, just something to think about. Um, They're not synonymous? No. Okay. I don't know. Courting versus dating. Versus dating. A lot of people that's think that's two different, two different things. Two different, it is two different so, things. So, so which one's the most serious one? Courting. Courting. Okay. Okay. Dating. Courting is a fact finding mission. You know, you spend your time, but you're not spending time in the bedroom. Oh. Oh. But you're, yeah. Okay, y'all getting deep on me now. Okay. All right. <laughs> we gonna we'll pick up that next week. We'll pick up right there. I know the young adults y'all won't be here next week, man. But but we but but we'll we'll brief y'all.